for today's talk, we are very happy to host the famous artist, Mr. Jerry Judah. Jerry was born in Calcutta and grew up there. When he was 10 years old, the family, parents, brother and sister, moved to London. He studied foundation art and design at Barnett College before obtaining a double first class honors degree in fine art at Goldsmiths College, University of London. After that, he studied sculpture as postgraduate at the Slade School of Fine Art in the University College of London. After he studied, Jerry opened a studio and began to work on large sculptures. I will not count the long list of works he did and are exhibited in many museums around the globe. I will only mention a large model he created of the selection ramp in Auschwitz-Birkenau for the Holocaust exhibition in the Imperial War Museum in London that was opened by the Queen. A glimpse of his works we will all see in a few seconds. Jerry lives and works in London. Jerry, before I hand you the mic, I wish to tell you that we are all like a new canvases, ready and anxious to observe your strokes of paintbrush and colors. Jerry, the canvases are yours. Can you see everything? Yes. Lovely. Um, hello, good evening. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you, Avner. Thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, it's a very uh, nice opportunity for me to get to show the work that I've done. Um, and of course, being part of the Indian Jewish heritage, it's an honor for me to um, be part of your talk. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm basically, this is a sort of slideshow of my work. There are over 300 images. Some are more detailed than others, but it's just to give you a glimpse of what it is I've been doing for the last number of years. There's a huge amount more that I could show you, but then that would go on for a very long time. So I'll try and not make it too long, and I'll try and be as brief as possible in each image, and then we can always discuss it any other time. Um, I was born in Calcutta into a Baghdadi Jewish community. My father was born in Rangoon in Burma, my mother was born in Calcutta, and uh, and I was born there and grew up there for my first 10 years in this uh, wonderful community, which was actually right part of the city, so to speak. My school was right in the middle of the city. We were just in, sort of in the suburbs and we were very much part of a community, which was the um, quarters, you could say, servicing the um, jute mills, which one of the elders of our community owned. So uh, we were very much a Baghdadi Jewish uh, community rather than an Indian community, but we also were very much part of Indian culture and very much part of the city. This actually, I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures. This is the sort of um, people that I grew up Britain grew from. This is my great grandmother and my sister um, in the 40s. Um, and, uh, and these are, this is pictures of my mother, her brothers and sisters, my grandmother. My mother's the second on the left. Um, so we were very much part of Indian culture, uh, you know, the village life and the city life all together. Um, and of course, we were a group of children that grew up together in the community. We were almost like a, it was like the quarters of the jute mills. And uh, my father was an overseer in the jute mills and a lot of the other members of the, fam uh, of the community were as well. And we were the kids that grew up together. We are still very, very close friends. Um, and we keep in touch with each other. I mean, a lot of these little children now are grandparents, so there you have it. And of course, this is another group photograph of us as we were growing up. And this was our badminton court in uh, Calcutta. I'm the boy third from the right, kneeling on the ground, if you must know. Um, anyway, as we grew up, this is uh, the, some of the people. This is my father on the left, back left, my uncles and cousins, and behind is the the apartments where I lived and grew up, and these were the grounds. This is the jute mills. This was taken 100 years after it was built, more, probably more so, 
Um, you can see there's no such thing as health and safety. There's a lot of um, noise, dust, machinery, pollution, heat, and very, 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 very hot. Um, and um, you can't imagine what it was like over there. But um, so my father worked in these mills. He was basically, I guess, uh, checking the production and so forth. Um, this is just a couple of buildings I'll show you in Calcutta. Um, very colonial. It was very much the capital of India before it went on to being Delhi. But uh, the architecture there was um, actually quite wonderful. A lot of the buildings are still as they were, you know, built. There's hardly anything happened to them. As a matter of fact, when I went inside my apartment a couple of years ago, where I grew up, I don't think they even repainted it. And this was a uh, one of the three synagogues. There was quite a, an established community. I think at that time there were probably about um, 5,000 of us. Um, and there were three synagogues. This was the Bethel. This is the synagogue that my mother and her family grew up with, where my parents got married. So it was a very, very established community um, and very, very beautiful architecture. And so this, you can see how it was set out over there. This is a typical Sephardi synagogue. Um, in Calcutta. There were three, Neve Shalom, uh, Makin David, and uh, our one, which was Bethel Synagogue. And uh, this is what's left of the apartments that I grew up with. I went, as I said, when we went back there two years ago, um, this is what was left of it. Um, very, very dilapidated, I'm afraid. Very, very sad. The beautiful grounds are now overgrown, um, you know, but they're still standing and they're still going. And we also had a clubhouse um, where we used to play, watch films and so forth. All of us kids got together. Those photographs that you saw of us as children was inside this house and inside this club and also outside. And that bit of grass was this, the badminton court where we played. So as you can see, time has moved on, but you know, you just have to move on with it. So, um, and these are some of the people in the community. My, my parents are there. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think I was born when this picture was taken. Um, and then we used to all get together. We used to have a thing called sukkah, where, where um, uh, all the families joined tables together and we shared dinner. So it was very much a Jewish community, very much um, a lively community. And uh, this was effectively probably my first visual theatre, aside from the extraordinary buildings and mosques and temples and synagogues, of course, we used to be up there decorating this, uh, sh this structure with flowers, with lights, with cutouts, with fruit. And it was really, really fun. And you can imagine what it was like when it was glowing at night. It was wonderful. That's my father on the back left with a cigarette in his hand. And he was quite a character, as you can imagine. So move on many, many years. Talking about sukkahs, this was my first sculpture that I made. Uh, this was the tabernacle, the sukkah, and this was made at, uh, in my studio in Shaftesbury Avenue. This was the first piece I made after I left the Slade. And I used to go around in the 70s, picking up demolished timber from old buildings and uh, denailing them, cutting them down and building sculptures out of them. Because plenty of those, uh, you know, that material was very much available. So I made this uh, in my studio in the basement, took it out. This was in Camden Art Center. This was a summer exhibition. I was one of three sculptors and I had the garden and, uh, and I put this thing up. It then moved on to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which was the first exhibition there actually. It was called Wood. And uh, then from then on, it went, uh, it was bought by Lady Gibbard, the wife of Sir Frederick Gibbard. And it went into their garden and uh, part of it still remains, I believe, but um, it's been a long time. Um, and during that time, I would be, you know, working in the theatre. I was in Covent Garden, my studio was Shaftesbury Avenue. But you go around the corner, this was at the Royal Shakespeare Company in the Old Witch. We were at the Donmar Warehouse. I worked at the Royal Opera. We would do anything from building scenery, painting props, backdrops and so forth. So I worked on this with the crew over there. We went out and picked up, again, lots of demolished timber lots of old ironwork, um, anything you can find and dress this so-called old Dickensian London. But it was more of an abstract um, sort of set rather than the old curiosity shop. And it was a tremendous success, as you can imagine. 
And of course, from then on, I moved on to what was available in terms of work. There was a huge amount of uh, creative um, opportunities out there, and especially in the advertising world. And we were just guns for hire. We would just make anything. So I did a lot of the Benson and Hedges adverts. This is just one of them. I made the cacti with the uh, little brass and all those little brass uh, were packets of bent and edges. In other words, we, I, I had letraceti, transparencies, we cut them and we, sorry, transfers and we applied onto it. So there were miniature packets of uh, cigarettes. I'm sorry that I, I, I'm glad to say I don't do that sort of work anymore, but you can imagine it was wonderful opportunity for creativity, for challenging you. Um, and you just had to be able to do anything sometimes I mean, one of the things we made was um, a city out of biscuits or a biscuit commercial. You would just do anything to do the work. And you just said, yeah, I can do it and we'll do it. And here was another example, um, a mosaic. We never made a mosaic before, but the, it was uh, Smirnoff and it was their campaign was one step ahead. So you had these uh, Romans um, on the back rowing over there on the left-hand side struggling. But the guys on the right are... Um, drinking a bottle of spurring off vodka with an outboard motor. And they saw one step ahead. Uh, so, you know, we did a Lasco caves with shopping baskets. It was fun, but it was just wonderful opportunity to just get your hands into doing anything. Never made a mosaic before. And here it is. So we made it. That was about, I would say, 20 foot long. We made all the tesserae uh, out of plaster, tinted them, cut them up, stuck them on. Just And we had to do it next to no time. And then take it to photographer's studio, put it all together, join it all, blend it all together, photograph it, and then throw it away. I think I still have a couple of pieces left from it. Um, then, of course, you'd make anything. This was um, uh, the, uh, uh, we made the uh, uh, replica of the St. Paul's facade in uh, Macau uh, for Expo for Lisbon, I think it was 1998, for Met Studio. Uh, they commissioned me to do this with the, uh, fabricators and the builders. So they built the uh, wall for us and then we applied all the um, uh, sculptures and facade onto it. And these were all made out of polystyrene, fiberglass, and we just built it, we took out all the bits out there, stuck it all up. And I think it was on there for a very long time. They just did it by, actually just by photographs from the building that I never ever visited it. So that's unfortunate, but I think they were very happy with it. And of course, uh, then I, uh, all this time I do my own work. And this was the sculpture I made for Amnesty International for human rights. And of course, I was very inspired by candles, you know, the Chinese saying better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So I made a sculpture, which was um, niches of candlelight. These were all little electronic wheat bulbs and they all flickered. And this was in St. James's Church in Piccadilly. Um, and we had it there for quite a while, but uh, unfortunately we didn't get the planning permission to build it at Potter's Fields, which is basically now where the GLA building is next to Tower Bridge. But it was fun to make, and, um, and I kept doing various projects like that. This is another version of it, which is for Sheffield, and British Steel uh, offered me all the steel, but again, funding was not possible. But this was uh, using mesh, and steel tubes with, again, flickering candles, but done in a different way. And here we designed the whole uh, landscape and everything right in the heart of Sheffield, but it didn't go ahead. But it was fun to do at the same time. I was then commissioned um, many, you know, this is all going in between various other projects. I'm just selecting the ones that I think will be pertinent to this talk. This is the selection ramp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, which I was asked to make for the uh, Imperial War Museum in London. Now, originally they wanted something very schematic, uh, basically a platform with some trains, a block saying the amount of people that uh, would be selected to go inside one of these carriages. But, and they gave me a, a photographic album called the Auschwitz album. Um, now, if you want to know more about this in my website, there's the, uh, under articles, there's an, a, a piece I wrote about the doing of this, and that will explain more about it. But we had to, in a particular, one moment in this model explain the process, a process of uh, people being brought in by trains, then the train stop, they're unloading the um, passengers or the victims or, whatever, or the prisoners, and then they're taken down to the selection ramp to be selected either for work, for labor or for the gas chambers. So this, uh, these um, 
This model was about 12 meters long, two meters wide, but it's only a small part of Auschwitz. Auschwitz actually goes forever, you know, on the, on the, other, on the left hand side of the screen, you've got a hell of a lot more barracks. Um, so these were the photographs from which I managed to work through how we did the people. We made all the people out of about like one inch high, cast them all in metal, made everything. And uh, this is where the men and the boys and the women and children were selected. And there they were unloading all their stuff to be put down for selection to go to what they call the Canada barracks, which was to select them for the Third Reich, all their goods. It was mayhem. I can imagine the noise and everything. But um, so it was these are the images, plus uh, my wife and I, Helen's a, an architect. So we went over to Auschwitz. They, they took us there. We measured everything. We looked up so many um, plans of um, gas chambers and barracks and uh, crematoria, and we built it all exact. This was basically a historic document. So these people, these women are affected. All those walking right are heading to the gas chambers. There's no question about it. Um, so this is uh, mayhem and uh, the selection that was going through. This was taken in June 1944. Uh, so there was one day, the SS, there was a photographer, he took it just one particular transportation. And uh, so, of course, we recreated that particular transportation. So this here coming down is the middle strata. That's where the people were selected. The people going on the top are heading towards the uh, labor, towards the, you know, for workloads. The ones at the bottom and turning left are those women and children you saw heading for the gas chambers. And this is another view of it. Everything was made absolutely detailed, correct. As a matter of fact, those uh, watchtowers, the ones up there now are made out of wood. They aren't the original watchtowers. Those are made by Steven Spielberg for a film and they left them there. The original watch watchtowers were actually made out of steel and I managed to locate that just in time to redo them. So I wanted this to be exact. So it's still in the Imperial War Museum. I believe it's going to be there till August next year. And I believe they found somewhere for it to go. So it's likely that we'll take it down and re clean it up, re just make sure everything's OK. But everything was made from scratch. Everything was made bang on the details. Um, and these are, of course, the people coming out and be selection and so forth. They're all metal. All the figures are exactly as we saw in the photographs. It took about two years, really, by the time we researched it and did everything. But it's fantastic because the Imperial War Museum actually left me to do this. They were really a fabulous support. And they thought, OK, I want to make this more like a filmic uh, piece rather than just a graphic piece. So uh, I think you'll notice as I go along that all these pieces are not just the quality of what I do, but the quality of the clients that I work for, because they have the vision. And if they have the vision to give you the scope to be able to do something, then why not? Let's get, get on with it. And this is the last picture. That uh, are the men and boys going down into the gas chamber. That mound over there is the gas chamber. That's Crematoria 3, the building just at the back. And uh, this was actually, I had photographs of this as well. And of course, who made it exactly to this. A little bit of room here and there for, you know, visual, um, you know, creativity, but not much. There you have it. That's a detailed picture. Um, just to show a little difference of the way I work, I designed a few bridges, um, not mega bridges going over the Thames or anything, but actually a bridge going along the Thames. This is the uh, river walk at the South Bank. And they, these are flood walls and they wanted people to walk as uh, an organization called Sustrans. So they asked me to design a sculptural bridge. So um, this is something we came up with. I worked with a really fantastic engineer from Ove Arup and uh, uh, we designed this bridge and that uh, platform cantilevers over the river wall. So you can actually, almost like you're standing over the Thames. That building in the background is the Tate and Lyle factory. And I think somewhere in the background, I think you see the Millennium Dome as well. Um, and it was really lovely at night, it reflected and lots of people use it and it's still up there exactly as it was made. 
So I like the whole uh, high tech element of it. And I thought I'll, you know, treat it as a sort of sculptural expression. Of course, the fabricators who worked on this are fabulous. They really did a, a tremendous job bending that steel exactly to the way it was drawn. No computers were used on this, it was all handmade. Um, this was a proposal for another bridge in the Woolwich Arsenal. That was, the other one was Woolwich Dockyard. And they asked me to make another bridge. I thought I'll do something out of glass where you go up the bridge, you go up these walls, and as you go right to the top, the walls lower down, so you get a view outside. And there are little slats or slits in the glass, which allow you to peek through as you go up. So it allows a little bit of interplay. Um, but uh, I think everybody got scared of glass, so this is what I ended up making, uh, sort of uh, spiraling steel, uh, sheet steel bridge, which goes over the wall. Um, I haven't got a picture of the final thing, but this is the cardboard model. I really believe in making models. Sketch models is the one way I work out all my ideas. I can't draw a line on the computer. So everything is literally, you know, cut and paste. Um, pencils and ink and so So now this enters another episode of my life. Um, at the time, uh, in the 80s, I would be working for many photographers. And one of them was a man called Charles Settrington, who was Viscount Settrington, who actually became the Earl of March, who is now the Duke of Richmond. And he owns Goodwood. And uh, he, of course, with the Goodwood uh, circuit and so forth, he started a thing called the Goodwood Festival of Speed. And he rang me up. I hadn't seen him for about 10 years. And he rang me up and said, oh, you know, remember you used to make sets for me. Could you make a triumphal arch with a, and we want to hang a Ferrari from it. So... I said, yeah, sure, whatever. So we went out, we, we made the, we had some uh, lighting structures we hired, clad it in uh, plywood and polystyrene, designed and made a Renaissance art, which not too elaborate because the budget was really, really terrible. And um, hung the Ferrari from it and put a sculpture of a horse on top. And this was 50 years of Ferrari. And uh, this set off um, a new uh, range of sculptures that I started to do for him. So then it was, there was a couple, there was a Porsche one before, and then we did Audi, where again, I had the opportunity to experiment and explore with different structures. Um, so this is a sort of a racing banking of these two cars, banking along. And it was always to show the cars, you know, this was the Avis and the Streamliner. That Streamliner was actually made specially for this. It was it, it made out of aluminium, it was very, very precious. And, you know, we didn't know what the hell we were doing, but we were just getting on with it and, you know, making these steel sculptures, hanging these cars off them, taking them down five days later, sending them back for racing, um, you know, and we were just having fun. Uh, so then the following year, I did a cat's cradle of Jaguar car. So again, I made a model. And uh, how, how do you make this? And that's how you make it. We worked out the engineering, the weights, and we... Um, put these cars up. So these are real cars with engines. Some of them, that silk cut weighs over a ton. And you would just be able to walk underneath it. There are people picnicking under these. I mean, it was just trust. There was no, we didn't think about health and safety or anything like that. We were just building these pieces. Um, and uh, if you wanted to know a bit more about the cars, which was very important, um, then I would put, so I would print the information on a piece of mirror tilted it so you can, when you stand reading it, you see the reflection of the car. So this way you uh, didn't have to, you know, crane your neck up and wonder what it's all about. You can just look at the um, uh, mirror and it will tell you all about it. Um, and then uh, this was an E-type sculpture. This was the only one where I actually made a car instead of uh, exhibiting a car because I just wanted something different. So uh, the E-type is a stunning shape. Uh, actually, the plan of it is purely a rectangle with rounded corners, but when you look at it sideways, it's a blinder. And uh, how do you make a big E-type and uh, work out? So um, these were huge tubes of steel, which I brought in from Antwerp. And we, uh, by fabricators, we worked out a way of cutting each tube. And when you join it together in a particular way, it's the shape of the E-type. Um, and this is the sculpture. It was about 32 meters high. Um, and these are different views of it. Those wheels are four and a half meters in diameter. They're enormous. The whole thing was absolutely gigantic. 
but I really, really loved it just because I love the actual car itself. But also this is pure sculpture. And instead of there being just sets uh, displaying the cars, I thought let's actually just make a sculpture. And of course the client was brilliant. Um, we worked out the center of gravity over here so that it stood and wouldn't, uh, you know, had to take enormous amount of wind loads. Um, but uh, it looked like the E-Type and everyone was gracious enough to believe it was. Um, and, you know, there were some people who said, well, it's all about the surface and the beautiful shape. But I think, um, you know, you should just experiment with anything. So here's my crew from Little Hampton Welding. They're an absolutely brilliant company. And um, they put it together for me. You can see a guy on top. We had him hanging down from a crane, you know, strapped down, and he had to go inside the tubes and bolt them together from the inside. There were, <laughs> there were about four foot, five foot diameter tubes. Um, and there we have it up there. So just this is to give you the scale of the piece. And I thought I'd just show you excitingly, these are the tubes we brought in from Antwerp. They were big gas tubes and very, very hard to get hold of. But, you know, you sort of take the material that you're working with and you, you know, start from there and move on. And this is in their workshops where they're cutting them to my shapes. So what we did is we worked out the shape of each tube with a sheet of paper. And then they plotted each uh, sheet of paper, drew it, cut them out, drew it and actually cut it by hand. There was no laser cutting, no CNC cutting on this. This was actually all cut and shaped by hand. And of course, this again is a Alfa Romeo. Their symbol is a four leaf clover. So I took the four leaves and uh, just twisted it around to display two cars, uh, the old Alfa Romeo and the new one. Um, and uh, they had to join perfectly well together. And these were rolled in um, angle ring in Birmingham. We brought it back, cut it to the exact shapes. We'll put it down together. And once we bolt it, we then weld it, take those bits off the edges and then paint them to this all really nice and smooth. Um, this is Mercedes Benz, a very lovely gullwing car. And this is an enormous uh, fabric. It's a PTFE. And uh, we just took the ellipse, which is what basically I would get every year from the Duke. And I would design something within that space. That was my patch basically. So I thought, let's take the whole patch, stretch the fabric. So we had to cut the fabric in particular ways. It was all very engineered with the car on top looking down and everybody was, you know, it was wonderful and lit up beautifully at night. Um, then oh, we did Ford and this was to celebrate the uh, GT 40s wins in Le Mans where there's a film about it. Um, and they came first, second and third. It was a 24 hour race. So how do I express 24 hours? So I thought I would do the, um, you know, uh, round the world, you know, plan um, 24 hours in the planet and, uh, so that's meant to be Earth, if you believe it or not. But these are the cars in the exact formation of their win. But that was too complicated to build. So I thought, let's do it with water. So I made this model out of uh, just a bit of plastic and a bit of super glue and made it look like it was the water because these cars actually won in the rain. It was, it was pouring with rain at the time. And I, we thought, how do we build it? So we developed the models and so forth. And that's it full size. So these are the GT40s in the exact formation of their win. And these were made out of uh, a polycarbonate uh, roofing material with an enormous steel structure at the back. And we had it at night, it would be lit up and the windscreen wipers were working and the water was being sprayed. It had an enormous water tank underground and we had the water just shooting up from these tubes from behind the car wheels. So there you can see the water being sprayed up. Pretty crazy, really. This is a real car, big full-size car, the um, GT40s here. Um, and of course, Mercedes-Benz, um, another one, they're, they're really super clients. They really are, you know, you know, all for adventure. And of course, the Duke is all for adventure. And I thought, well, why don't we just do a big steel arch that goes over the house? One car going one way, one car going the other way. They're sort of passing each other. This is not a photoshopped picture. It is absolutely a real photograph. No cutouts, no cheating. This is the real thing. And this is a hundred meter arch. 
and uh, there you have the uh, Le Mans, uh, no, sorry, the Grand Prix winners. Um, the car on the right, the older car, is a replica. The one, uh, the newer one, is the Lewis Hamilton one. I was actually in um, Budapest when he won with that car in um, uh, Grand Prix. Um, and that's it over the house. And of course, this is us lifting the arch. So what we did is we had the smaller one already down, and then we lifted the large one over the house. And that's uh, all the guys up there putting it together. And then we put the cars on afterwards. Fabulous. I mean, you know, the thing is you work with your engineers, you work with your fabricators, you collaborate, and then you know you're gonna get it right. And that's what's so fantastic about them. This is a Porsche again. Um, these were the uh, 911s. Um, and of course, it looks like it's going to fly off, but actually it's very, very simple. It's uh, propped. The car in the middle is propping the two cars at the side, or you could say vice versa. So there it is sideways. Um, but uh, And they all come down to a point, right down to a couple of inches in the ground. And this is using a, a thing which we did, of course, with the Mercedes Benz over the house. It's a monocoque structure where you cut out the steelwork in a particular pattern and you create a monocoque. And that is just, it's a, basically, it's pure steel uh, skin. There's no internal structure whatsoever, but it's really, really strong and everything is welded together. So the clients are very happy. So they said, would you make one that will go outside our factory and museum in Stuttgart, the Porsche Platz. So there we did a different version of it. And that's the roundabout, it's still there. And um, yeah, it looks fabulous. And these are three uh, Porsche cars, which they made specially or they rebuilt specially for me um, in, um, uh, in the factory and uh, put it up there. So they're really thrilled with it, uh, as am I. Of course, there had to be a little bit more substantial than the Goodwood ones, because these are going to last for a very long time. Um, and that's uh, the actual 911. Renault, a uh, bit more fanciful. I thought, let's do a giant feather. So again, everything is model. This is a model I made out of brass and painted it white. We cut the cars out of plastic, made the model of the house. So really, if you show the clients the model, they love it. Um, and because they know what they're going to get. And they fabulously trust us to do this. So um, we made this one. Um, and that's the real thing over there. Murder to paint that blue thing. It was a nightmare, but uh, we managed to do it just in time. And uh, it was up there for a you know, good two weeks, really, because we have it up and then take it down and so forth. And that's it in the distance. Lovely flamboyant piece of sculpture, which uh, I was really thrilled with. And that's it from underneath. So all those tubes are slotted into each other. So it's all very carefully worked out. And they're all made in different, slightly different angles to show a sense of, uh, you know, the feather is being blown around. And then we have Land Rover. Land Rover is, well, it's the car that can climb any terrain. So um, we made a giant rock out of big girders of steel. So we put the rock in the 3D model and then cut it in X, Y, Z axes to create different lines. And then basically built those lines out of steel and joined them together. And then we put the cars up there. These are real cars. And that's a real person climbing up it. The Duke had him up there and down every couple of hours to give people a sense of excitement. So we had this abseiler, this mountaineer, and he would just do the thing, I guess. Uh, that's his job. And then that's the inside of it, which was really quite fun. Um, this is Rolls-Royce. Um, because it, they were sponsoring this, we thought we'll do the Rolls-Royce engines, the RR engines, which basically did the Supermarine. That plane over there is from uh, the Southampton Hall of Aviation. Uh, we brought it out to 1928 Schneider Cup trophy winner. It's made out of aluminium. And the actual skin of that plane is almost like eggshells. It's so fragile. We have to be really careful how we handled it. That car is Bluebird. We brought it in from Daytona. And the K4 boat, the Bluebird, didn't exist. It was long gone. But I got the drawings and everything from it. So we had, um, so we made that actually, 
that's the only prop actually in the whole of my Goodwood pieces, and that was made out of fiberglass, but it's exactly to the boat uh, that uh, we made. And this is the plane, it's absolute blinder of an airplane. And we had to be really careful how we put it together. And of course the Bluebird, that's about 30 foot long. It's an absolute stunning car. And we just, they said, okay, you can borrow it, borrowed it, had it shipped over from, you know, uh, Florida and here it is up there. Quite beautiful. And all these uh, uh, sculptures are steelwork with fabric. So there's, um, this isn't bent steel, it's just fabric. And of course, everything has models. So I just do a simple sketch model. This was the model I designed. Uh, I was going to have four cars, but we ended up four bars. We ended up with three. And just take mesh, cut it up, bend it. And there you have it. There's your sculpture. Everything has got to be in my book a lightness of touch. It's it mustn't be too complicated. It's got to tell a story without, you know, over overdoing it. Having said that, here's a complicated piece. This is for Toyota, uh, and uh, so I based it on the um, Tori Gates, uh, uh, the shrine uh, in Japan. And uh, the idea was that the gates, these uh, big arches, support the cars. And the cars, in a way, support the arches. Everything is held together. Without those cars and those cables, those arches would fall down, and vice versa. And if you don't think we can do this, well, there you have it. That's the real thing. Um, these are absolute original cars, worth thousands and thousands of pounds, millions, I would say, but we put them up. And these are McAloid bars. They, uh, they're particularly stressed uh, cable steel rods, which uh, had to be engineered. Everything is absolutely engineered. I even had lights inside the arches on top so that at night it would light the whole thing. So you can actually walk underneath it and walk through. It was actually like a promenade. Um, they're beautiful machines. And of course, when we were in Japan, I photographed the thing that inspired me. Um, and these are the uh, gates over there. And uh, Honda, another good word. This was the kinetic sculpture. We built this arch and these were original cars. And they went, they moved up and down. So what uh, we had over here was that underneath each car, it was a little motor. Now this, each of these arms, which are 60 meters long, were balanced. If you just pushed it with your finger, they'd go up and down. They were precisionly balanced. And those little rotating arms underneath the car, once they rotate, it shifts the balance and make the uh, tubes go up and down. So they all went up and down. It was really wonderful. It was almost like a chariot race, if you're looking at it from the side. Alas, I didn't have any film of that because I was too busy uh, trying to just get the thing up and down. Um, and these are the sketch models that I made um, to show the client, which they absolutely loved. And we just built it. And this is the previous version of it. So I, I tend to make different views and different versions of things to get it right. Um, again, everything I do with models. This is a sculpture for Bernie Ecclestone, his five decades of motorsport. So um, they gave me five cars and we had to make this in three months. Uh, absolutely made in three months, an enormous steel sculpture. Uh, that was a Connaught, the Ferrari, the BMW, I can't remember the other, Mercedes and Lotus. Uh, and they are beautiful, beautiful cars worth, um, anyway, never mind about the money, but this was 45 meters high. And uh, again, I like the idea of line. I like to have a very simple line that you just sketch and then you have um, sculpture. Not worth making it too complicated. Um, and this, this was just looking up at closer at the uh, structure of how we held the cars up. So when you're actually underneath it, you're meant to just see the cars and not really see the sculpture or the structure behind holding the cars up. So I try and design that as much as possible. And of course, these are my original sketches. I thought I'd show them in just, um, I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of sketch and drawings of all those pieces. Um, this is Lotus. This is a true monocoque sculpture, it's a trefoil. And this was absolutely complicated because we had to cut all the steel shapes in precision. 
And this, each of these steel sheets are like eight mil, 10 mil thick. Some in the bottom are even 20 mil thick and everything had to join precisionly. So it was all made in the factory, brought together and joined in to be one continuous shape. So if you were, if you worked it that you were about not even half an inch off, it would not join together. It was so, so complicated to make. And these are original cars, our Art and Senna's, Fittibaldi's, Jim Clark, that beautiful Lotus up there. I mean, they just let us put these cars up. And this was with uh, Lotus, Team Lotus. They were fantastic lending us the cars. Um, and uh, there you have it. This is the actual piece finished. And this is my crew working on it. So all those joins, uh, all those little brown things are where we joined it. We then weld it all together and sand it down, grind it down, paint it and so forth to make it look like it's one piece. This is only up for about three days, four days effectively for the festival speed and it's taken down and the steel is recycled, sent off for recycling. Uh, this is Mazda. Uh, that car on the left they made specially for the sculpture. Um, that was the other car's original racer, Le Mans racer. And uh, we wanted to do something with a twist, and, a, and I mean a real twist. So my way of doing that was to stack big tubes of steel in a particular size, in a particular angle. And once you get them on top of each other, it makes a beautiful shape. Um, very, very simple, like Jenga in a way, but uh, uh, on all the steel tubes, um, they start at the bottom at 200 uh, millimeters, uh, 20 centimeters square, and they get smaller and smaller as they go up. So the ones on the top is only like about 18 mil square. So like from say eight inches to two inches, and then the cars go up there. Um, and this is very, very exciting. And they look wonderful when it was lit up at night. They really, really were. I mean, I, would, I took these snaps while I was standing as the lights were changing. And of course, this inspired various clients who love this and asked me for a sculpture. Uh, but oh, yeah, I forgot I had a couple of these shots of my uh, crew working on it as we put it up. The, then we put the cars on top, finally. You go away, everything is wonderful and simple. Again, to do with simplicity. So that inspired me to make another sculpture. This is for Gibbs Farm Sculpture Park in New Zealand, in the North Island. This is a client of mine called Alan Gibbs. And he has huge sculptures there, Anish Kapoor, Andy Goldsworthy, Richard Serra. So, you know, I was, it was a fabulous company to be part of. And this, all these sculptures, they were about 30, 32 meters high. This is 34 meters high. Very strange without a car on top for me, because I sort of got used to that. But I think I managed to make this work. I call this Jacob's Ladder. My Hebrew name is Yaakov, Jacob, so uh, it felt pertinent to me. But it does look absolutely stunning in the landscape. And um, the client's very happy with it. And um, yeah, and so, you know, various other sculptural parks have seen this. And so, oh, I'd like something like that, or can you do with that sort of thing in mind? Um, and this is the, they actually made this for me in New Zealand. Um, this actually was not made in the UK. And those are the tubes of steel at the bottom. And that's how it looks as you uh, make it as you go along. So they changed slightly at different angles. So we engineered it all over here. Everything was engineered to precision. All the drawings were done, sent out over there, and they put it together. And this is sculpture I just put up a month ago. Well, not me personally, but we built this in the UK, in Little Hampton and sent up to Dallas in Texas for a client. Um, I call this drift. It's the sort of Jacob's Ladder come master sculpture idea of stacked steel, but horizontally this time. And uh, as you go around, it just looks different. And that's what I think makes a great sculpture. At the moment there, it's on um, turf. I've got some shots being taken next week of it in the distance in the background. So that will be up on my website very soon. But uh, that was uh, about uh, <clears throat> 18 meters long. No, sorry, 14 meters long, six, seven meters high. So this is small for me, but, um, and that's the inside of it. And that's it in the workshop when we finally put it together. This is before it went for painting. So that gives you an idea of its scale. 
So I like doing small sculptures too. Um, you know, this for me is really small. Um, and then we put it together in, we built the crates and, uh, you know, crated them up, sent them to Southampton, shipped them off to Houston, drove it up to Dallas, put it up there. There it is on its way, three big crates of sections. This is one of my favorite pieces. This is uh, Porsche again. And this is a 52 meter high sculpture. Again, a monocoque, but a six sided monocoque and a three sided. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, bit that goes to the ground is two inches in diameter. You can actually put your hand around the bottom, but those cables that hold it are each take 65 tons of pressure. So it's uh, absolutely engineered into a precision. And these are the real, real cars. And everything's going right to the ground. Beautiful uh, sculpture, beautiful weather, beautiful cars, and a beautiful um, job to do. Again, we did it in very, very next to no time. And I want to keep it as simple and as clean and as uh, sharp as possible. Um, and uh, of course, that gives you an idea of scale with people over there. I think my son, that's my son at the bottom with his girlfriend. And that's Pablo and as well, a good friend of mine. And this was at Festival of Speed. And this is the, I just thought I'd show you a couple of examples of the knuckle, the nexus. This is the bit inside where everything's put together and we join the arms with the cars on them. And that's the cars attached to that bit. Um, and then we're ready to take that on a crane and lift it up. And there it is being lifted up. This was something like out of close encounters. Uh, it was really quite stunning as, you know, as it went up in the air. And, and uh, there was the um, shaft ready to take it. So that thing actually slotted bang on to that shaft. There are my guys up there ready, ready to uh, bolt it all together. That was one of the largest mobile cranes in the country. So we had to put that up. And that sits from underneath looking up. It was very, very exciting. I, I just I, I just stood underneath it, just took hundreds of photographs. And there it is joining on together, quite lovely. And just before it goes down. And uh, there it is joined and they're bolting it all together. Didn't need to do very much onto it. It's all been done. And then there's the cone. And that bit goes very lasting on top. Um, lovely plane zooming by in the distance over there. And there it is, put on top. And there we are. I just, that's it. I was driving away, trying to get back to London. It was a Friday and I just was a long day in the hot sun, but the guys were just brilliant. Uh, going back, this is Audi again, very simple, a line of, uh, a line of swoosh, uh, you know, whatever you call it, you know, old car, new car. And, um, just for, uh, again, simplicity of touch, but this was done in silver, nightmare to paint, but lovely, lovely piece to do. And the kids are up there interacting with it. And that all stood up. And uh, uh, I'm going to, not many more cars to be honest, but this is a client of mine. He is, their father was uh, for his 70th birthday. They want to give him a birthday present in Mexico. And this is in Mexico. So he's got a collection of Ferrari cars. So again, I designed this monocoque, uh, which um, I, I have to uh, declare that a major part of my success is working with a character called Bruno Postal and Hume and Buggy, who are these two incredible engineers, designers. And Bruno worked out how we can do the monocoques on these. I do the sketches, do the ideas, and then we work out together the shapes of each piece of steel and how it's joined together. So this, are, this again are three bits of steel stuck together or welded together to make the sculpture. It's only four meters high. This is really small for me on a plinth of one and a half meters high. And the cars were made uh, by another company who worked for me called Atom Model Makers. And they're fantastic. I'll show you those. So that's the old uh, Ferrari and the newer one. And that's the paintwork that we did. And these were shot in Mexico. And that's how it was made in the factory in Little Hampton. All the pieces of steel welded together, no internal structure. All that big stuff you're seeing inside is just a jig. And once we stick the whole thing together, we release the jig. 
and then uh, the thing stands on its own without the jig. So that's it in its raw steel. And then we would, uh, you know, uh, paint it, prime it and so forth, paint it red in the factory and uh, then join it together. These are the cars all being created to go off to Mexico. So these cars are about two foot long and that's them being made. They're milled out of a thing called Kemi wood, which is a plastic and uh, hand finished. Um, and that's a model of the car, smaller model. And that's the larger models that we made. And it's all put together, everything, the lights are made. And this is the crew in Mexico put it, putting it together. And uh, grass was laid, the client was very happy. I'd love to do more of this scale actually, because it's fun. Um, moving away from cars, I was asked, I was commissioned by uh, uh, the Sharuk, which is the um, investment development authority in the Arab Emirates in, a, in Sharjah, uh, to come up with an idea for a monument in front of this new library designed by Norman Foster. And it was a monument, which is uh, basically Sharjah was the book capital, capital of the book by UNESCO uh, last year. So they wanted something uh, to uh, commemorate this. And I thought of a scroll, the unraveling of a scroll, which is the origin of the book. So I did a number of sketches. And of course, Bruno and I, uh, we developed that onto a monocoque into, uh, these are still my original sketches. And, uh, you know, in various, I just thought I'd play around with different materials. And there it is, the final thing, uh, 38 meters high on top of a mound. That is raw steel, um, very, very thick, very, very engineered, made in Sharjah and in, in Dubai uh, by this huge crew and uh, put together. And that's it, finished. Um, this is, the library is actually just being finished now. It's a stunning building, very, very beautiful, very elegant. So I want to do something very, very simple. So they, we could light it at night. It was actually gorgeous. A fantastic client, really. They really were extremely generous and obliging and really, really encouraging, uh, very honest, very, yeah, very gracious, very, very gracious. And this is my uh, crew, or their crew, or their crew, putting the landscaping, doing the final touches on it. Um, you can see how lovely the light shines on it. The weather there is stunning, you know, just, and it had to, this had to be engineered with paint and materials to be able to take that sort of sandstorm. And even while we were there, there were a number of sandstorms. So, um, you know, you had to make sure that you could withstand all of this. And this, of course, there's still a couple of shots of the teams working on it. And this is an artist impression taken from my sculpture, my designs, and this was done at Foster's. And that's the library of the book. It's called The House of Wisdom. And it's a digital library, I believe. It's going to host a world collection of books and so forth. And it was really wonderful, fantastic team to work with. Really, really brilliant. Now this is moving on to another part of my work, my paintings. Of course, when I did Auschwitz, I was sort of, inspired by history. And of course, we were reaching on contemporary history and conflict, not just Middle Eastern conflict, but Eastern European conflict. And of course, uh, uh, they're all based on settlements that were destroyed by bombs, or even to be honest, by climate change, you know, so anything or just the uh, destruction of our settlements, our environment. So I built these uh, buildings out of um, well, foam board, and then uh, and uh, we stuck them on canvas, and I smashed them on the canvas, and then uh, painted on them with acrylic gesso and with the details of water towers, cables, satellite dishes, and so forth. They all had to be composed in a particular. This is about, I think, this painting is about four meters by two meters. They're sort of the largest versions of them. But they were called angels, um, and uh, that, of course, is uh, the composition is very, very important to me, and how they sit in the landscape. And of course, this is Beirut um, after bombing, but uh, the textures and the way the dust just sort of levied out the colours was uh, extraordinary. But um, sort of in, these were not just about 
uh, conflict and buildings and destruction. They're also about the language of painting, which is my first thing that preoccupied me actually really very, very uh, simplistically. And working with the paints to just blend in all the shapes, all the lines, so that you're playing with light and not just um, shapes and colours. So I know that Avner said very graciously, oh, the palette of colours, but I think the, the best colour which accompanies all colours is white. Um, and uh, so these are various views of various paintings and various details. And uh, there's an angel. Uh, this is my favourite of all of them. It's a destroyed angel, the angel's wings. Uh, very fragmented. This actually is probably my most emotional piece. Um, and uh, these are the close details of it. Again, everything built and destroyed on the canvas. And there are various, various versions of them. All of them, pretty much all of them have gone to collections. Um, this is a close up of country, white country, again, destroyed, um, different views of it. And here are some close-up shots of it. I thought I'd just show you some detailed shots of the buildings and how they were destroyed. So again, all these were made as full buildings with walls, staircases, lift shaft, bedrooms, doors, everything. And then I destroyed them on the canvas. And that's how you do it. That, so these are almost like performance pieces, but they're very, very um, emotional again and uh, evocative. But to me, it's all about the language of painting. It's, it's, it's sort of like 3D drawing in a way for me. And of course, there are other versions of it. And of course, there's black. This is pure black. Um, and I, I make my own paints. I make my own gesso. I, I mix it with iron powder and plaster and uh, paints and waxes um, and uh, apply them onto the canvas once I break them. And then I keep on breaking them more. And some of these canvases, they are one settlement already before destroyed. I levied the whole thing. I actually destroyed the entire canvas with all the buildings on it. And some of them are very complicated pieces. Um, this, for example, this canvas over here, the one with the, um, sorry, this one here, the one on the right, turned out to be a completely different, that building doesn't exist anymore. That canvas became this canvas which is an entirely different piece. So there's a sort of archeological element to the pieces. It's layered, it has a history in its own. So there's a, there's a thing of honesty about the way it works. It's, it's not just let's um, texture it the way we want. And some of them take a year, you know, by the time I get around to it. I'm actually working on a canvas now, which I started six years ago. And believe me, that has been through various, various um, uh, different versions. And this is the triptych that I made. This is at the Louise Bluan Institute. This is the exhibition of um, the paintings up there for a show I had a few years ago. So they've been in a number of uh, uh, shows and exhibitions and some in red. Uh, this is Babylon. This is uh, based on Bruegel's Tower of Babel, but contemporized with um, uh, satellite dishes and apartments and uh, you know water towers and so forth. And then, of course, uh, I was commissioned by the Imperial War Museum North in Manchester. They wanted one of my pieces on the wall, this giant wall that, up there, and they thought it would be really fun. Let's do something dramatic. So this was the Crusader, and this was based on the White Cross, the war graves of World War I, World War II, and with uh, destroyed buildings on it. Those, all those bits of steel which are stabbing it, I was inspired by, um, you know, Throne of Blood, Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, the Macbeth, where he was shot by all his army. Thousands of arrows went to him. And this is sort of almost like the blitzkrieg of buildings. They're all almost like arrows or blitzkriegs or missiles flying into these buildings. And these, of course, the detail of them. They're quite large. Each of these buildings are two, three foot long, you know, and they're all, again, smashed onto the uh, structure itself. And then I was asked by St. Paul's Cathedral, maybe we could put a couple of my paintings on the wall to commemorate the First World War in 2014. But I didn't want to just put my paintings up. I said, I'd rather do something original. And of course, the Crusader inspired me on this. So I made this, which were the um, 
again, uh, the contemporizing the First World War because of the carve up of the Ottoman Empire, the issues in the Middle East where ISIS and so forth are trying to destroy the um, Sykes-Picot Agreement. So there's a lot of history involved in this. So I thought rather than poppies and uh, emotional, I thought I'd do something historic and something sort of original uh, over here. And um, so these pieces are actually still there. They were meant to be there for uh, nine months and they're now there six years. I expect they'll probably stay there. You can imagine, you know, putting this on, you know, Christopher Wren's actual original stonework. Um, the trust, they never, they just saw one sketch model and they said, fine, let's go ahead. No one interfered. Actually, to be honest, none of my projects, uh, any clients interfered. Uh, because they just trust you. I suppose it's, um, you know, you just have to be honest with them and say, this is what I'm going to make, and they believe you. And um, so this is in my earlier studio uh, where we were making it. So everything was made out of um, uh, paper and card, and we cut everything, again, with lift shots, and I was destroying all of these pieces on the structure. And then... Uh, and. Uh, and then I started working into it with acrylic gesso and so forth. Um, so, um, uh, and detailing it with lift shafts, I mean, uh, sorry, water towers and so forth. And here's another version I did. This is the Red Knight. This is about four meters, no, five meters high in fiberglass. It's just a red version of the St. Paul sculpture. So I made a variety of them. Now we're moving to the last phase in a way of this um, talk. This, these are a uh, series of sculptures I made called Bengal. Uh, I was taken by, invited by Christian Aid and the Arts Council to go to India, to Calcutta, where I was born and grew up, and to look at what they were doing for climate change. Uh, you know, uh, Christian Aid uh, tend to sponsor artists, with, along with the Arts Council, like Don McCullen and John Keane and so forth, to look at various of their outreach projects. So this was climate change. Now we went to, you know, everywhere from the communities, urban, rural, Dalits, um, you know, untouchables, you know, the most amazing uh, places uh, to see how they were living and how they were coping with climate change and what can be done about it. But I didn't want my work to be obvious. I didn't want it to say, well, you know, these are, these are sculptures of people, you know, um, you know, struggling with water and so forth. So I thought I'd do something a little bit more lyrical, a little bit more poetic, and take symbols. And of course, the symbol in all of these pieces is the rickshaw. Now, these are actually, this is only about three foot high. These are all models. They're not real big sculptures. So I know they look like that because they're highly detailed. So, um, and of course, what was happening at the time when I was there was it was the Durga Puja festival. These pandals, they make out of the internal structures out of bamboo and they tie them all together with a rope and wire and whatever and of course this is not bamboo this is purely um, wood which I cut up on the bandsaw thousands and thousands and thousands of strips of plywood stuck it all together and made these sculptures so this is a temple and uh, this was these were proposals for large sculptures so this temple was to be made out of polluted earth polluted earth in India resins together to the uh, typical uh, Siddhya temple in, um, and also temples in Bengal. So uh, this is only about two foot high. This is actually the collection of the Mittals and also another collection, the um, uh, Shane uh, Sayers, uh, Janet Sayers collection. So, um, uh, and of course, here's a copper tree, but it's the roots of a tree. One of the places we visited was mangroves where the water was completely down and all the roots were exposed. It was really, really quite a sad sight to look. They're almost like corpses, these trees. And there were all these roots just drying out in the heat. So I thought I'll make a sculpture out of tubes of uh, copper, which we cut and bent and shaped and tied together to be the root. So it's, it's the upside down tree with the roots drying out in the air on a rickshaw, decapitated almost, you could say, on, on that. So there's a little... They're sort of violent, but they're also trying not to be. This is based on Collagat, which is this big power station that feeds uh, Calcutta. Coal-fired power station with these big chimneys. Um, and this is about six foot high, again on a rickshaw. All these rickshaws are made out of brass 
all hand built everything and all these uh skull all these structures are hand built tied together and to create these um these pieces quite lovely I, I mean and then i loved working with the colors and the wax and these are the juggernauts which of course these are all sort of inspired from these are these enormous sort of temples and shrines which they wheel around they actually wheel with hundreds and hundreds of people pulling them they're quite extraordinary quite stunning um and uh <clears throat> and you know these are for for the festival so this is where the actual juggernaut uh, that we call these big trucks juggernauts are based on this uh, particular um uh, event uh, i mean of course uh, that is absolutely stunning piece of artwork um and of course going back to the climate change the idea was uh, i thought i would do this exhibition called the four elements bengal the four elements fire water earth and air so I want to take four elements and do something with them. So these are clouds on a, on a tower. Uh, so, uh, and on a miniature rickshaw. So this piece is only about three foot high, two, three foot high. So their sketch models actually draw three dimensionally. And again, a cloud on a rickshaw, a big, um, you know, different versions of it. It's all tied together, all highly detailed. So basically what we do is we just had tons and tons of um, bits of plywood cut in circles and just started snipping them together. So they, these are 3D, uh, I suppose, again, uh, drawings. Um, and it's just a sort of very simplistic version of a cloud. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, this is water, splash, you know, waves of water, again, on a tower. Um, so it's water, fire, water, earth and air. And this is taking the, again, the rock I did for Goodwood, but I re-proposed re, uh, it in a way, changed the whole dynamic of it. Um, and it's the, the earth, the element of earth on it. This is about uh, six foot high. Um, and everything's balanced on those rickshaws. I mean, it's quite a piece of engineering alone. Um, and these are all details. So these are tiny. These, uh, these wheels are only about four inches in diameter. But, um, you know, I like detailing things. Uh, this is the fun bit of it. And also it comes from my having worked in films where the camera would go really close up. So I like people to be able to see really close up. And these are other sketch models that we did based on that. Again, using curved bits of wood, sticking it together to make a big old rock on a rickshaw. Um, and of course the um, flame, again, I thought I'd reappropriate what we did with charge with the scroll, but it could be a flame. So it's very simple shapes, but actually um, everything highly detailed, tied together with bits of wood. Um, and what we did was the original piece of this, we made it in cardboard and then stuck the wood on top of the cardboard like we did the monocoque and then peeled the cardboard away. It was a bit like instead of lost wax, it was a lost, lost card uh, method. And this is portal. Uh, just, a, just a very simple shape of looking into the sky through these. I just wanted to make a big circular structure. Sometimes, you know, I'm so impulsive, I'll do what I want. And this is one line that twists around each other and joins each other, and then everything held by these radiating arms. And again, all tied together with copper wire, cloth. Just a feeling of how you would make it in a, in a village. And this is again another tower, but these are, are made out of bamboo. I actually managed to find these very, very real bamboos in, um, from Scotland, had it brought down. And they were only about not even quarter inch thick or some of them are even less. And we just let, it's all done freehand, no computers, no, well, there are some drawings, some sketches, which you'll see in a minute, but um, everything joined together. You know, looks like this, looks like that using the E-type Jaguar sculpture idea of just thought, let's see what we'll do that if we made it out of tubes of steel. So this is uh, tubes of plastic, and this is meant to be a splash of water. So this is water on a rickshaw. Um, so I did a water, and it's the only computer piece in all of these. It's, um, we did a splash in 3D, I did with Bruno, and then we did all these circles, which is basically the outer skin of the water splash. And then it becomes, a uh, the shape in itself. So I can do thousands of different shapes on these if I wanted. 
Um, but, you know, I want to move on to the next idea. I don't want to stick to one idea. And this is the exhibition of these pieces, which we just finished in Grisdale Sculpture Forest and also in Dolby Forest in Yorkshire. This is in the Lake District. So these are the pieces that you can see the real size of that. That one is, by the way, of my head with candles around it. So that was a very personal piece because it's sort of like a shrine with the candles, which I, I wanted very much to do. So it's an Indian temple with my head. That's my profile and then these uh, radiating uh, rays of candles. Um, so these are the pieces. They just literally finished a week ago and came back to London in boxes. So this was a museum exhibition uh, and it was the Bengal of Four Elements. And uh, we published a book based on this with all the drawings and sculptures. And these are, again, the original pieces up there. And all the drawings are original drawings. So there are a number of different versions of these sculptures. I mean, I've only showed you a very small amount of them that can go on and on. And these are my drawings. Uh, they all vary from A4, A3 up to giant pieces. And they're all done in charcoal, oil stick, wax stick, um, everything freehand, everything just, I just work on it as I go along and just to get a feel for it. Um, I sometimes have no idea where I'm going with them, but um, I think I, it comes to a nice conclusion at the end. So uh, the main part of my practice is drawing. I draw and I draw and I draw and I draw. And when I'm not drawing, I'm drawing. I absolutely love it. Um, I actually did a blinder today, but I would say that. And this is again, the splash, which we it started to make out of bamboo, but um, you know, so these are larger pieces. These are about four foot by three foot. Some are three foot by two foot all made out, it's drawn out of charcoal, drawn out of oil pastels. And, um, you know, and they, the photographs don't do them any justice. When you see them in the flesh, they're actually quite lovely because the light, I, I like to work with the, with the light. So, um, and this is just a tiny A4 drawing. And these are sketches of earlier pieces. So I just draw and I draw and I draw and I draw. Finally, um, I was asked early on, this year, I think, or last year, by Chabad to uh, come up with an idea for their um, menorah for Hanukkah at uh, Trafalgar Square. And they wanted something original and different. So I thought, well, why don't we do a glass um, menorah? Just something that, you know, just something a bit abstract, a bit interesting. And they loved it. But I think with uh, coronavirus and maybe issues to do with funding, um, we have not managed to get this off the ground, but it's available. So hopefully one day I'll make something like this. Um, and uh, I, I think this is it. This is my last image. Uh, I've got hundreds and thousands more with different operas, ballets, pop videos, commercials, museums. Um, the one thing I must say in all my work is that it's not about me. I know I'm giving this talk. It's all the people I've worked with, the collaboration. And more so, it's about the clients who've had the trust in me to give me the complete freedom to do what I want to do. And, uh, and, and of course, working with a team is the primary thing, you know. Um, uh, you know. They've been fantastic support. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I hope you've enjoyed the work. And I'm available should anybody want to ask me anything. But I'm more available to have a sip of this wine, which I'm desperate to do. So thank you very much. And um, anyway, I'm available. Should um, anyone want to ask me anything or just even say goodbye? Andrew wanted to say yes, something. I, I, well, it's, it's Marcel, his wife. Um, what I wanted to say is that when you're commissioned to do something, um, mm. the idea of, of what is wanted how does that sort of come to you? <laughs> it just seems amazing all the things that you've done and uh, all the various ideas you've had. I just wonder how you, you get these you different get ideas. Where do you get the inspiration from? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very hard to pinpoint. I mean, uh, I think the one thing is I don't do brands. So I don't let the, um, I, uh, the, the, um, end product or what it is they're trying to say direct me of course you know um 
with something like the paintings or something like St. Paul's or whatever, you know it is what you're trying to do. But um, I guess, you know, I just always loved big theatrical theatricality of things uh, growing up in India and plus maybe it's my ego, I don't know, but um, I, I, I just always draw different ideas, different sculptures. I see which, where things lead to each other. I, I, it's very hard to say how they come. It's, it's, all, it's, it's very organic. Mm. And sometimes it, you know, when someone once said a good idea can take a long time, but a great idea can take a moment. And I think yeah. if you get that quick inspiration, then it's brilliant. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry, thanks a lot. We yeah. enjoyed it. It was wow, amazing. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have you. Have a very uh, pleasant weekend. Shabbat shalom, everybody. And uh, namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. How do I look at all these chats? Where do I see that in here? Yeah. I'll send it to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everybody.